Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Holly Kuzmich of the George W. Bush Institute and our esteemed panel. Good morning. It's great to be at Concordia. Good to see all of these faces in the room, and I know people joining on the live stream this morning. Um, I'm Holly Kuzmich, Executive Director of the Bush Institute, and I'm thrilled to be joined by three amazing women this morning uh, to talk about 20 years of PEPFAR. We're going to look back a little bit, but we're also going to look forward. Um, and so joining me today, um, I've got three great people. Carmen Villar is the Vice President of Social Business Innovation at Merck. Carmen, great to see you. Uh, Dr. Mamadi Yia is Deputy Coordinator for Multisectoral Relations in the Office of the U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator at the State Department, Mamadi Back by Popular Demand. <laughs> Great to see you. And then last but certainly not least, the Honorable Minister, Senator Lizzie Nkosi, uh, the Minister of Health in Eswatini. Thank you for being here. Um, so le let's look back just a little bit. Um, next year will be 20 years of PEPFAR, and you all have intimate experience with this program in a whole variety of ways over the last 20 years. In the early 2000s, 36 million people were living with HIV and AIDS. Um, nearly 22 million lives had been claimed, and less than 1% of people had access to life-saving treatments. Um, 20 years later, uh, PEPFAR has saved the lives of over 21 million people. It's an amazing story, but we still have so much more work to do, and we're going to talk about that today. And one of the things that I think is so significant about it is um, it has had support across four administrations and ten Congresses, and we want that to continue. Um, and that's something I think that we don't focus on enough, is the bipartisan support that it has received. Um, what we're going to talk a little bit about today is the key role that partnerships play, both in PEPFAR and in the work we're now doing on cervical cancer, the platform that PEPFAR has created to be able to address other health issues like cervical cancer, but not solely cervical cancer. And here's the reason we all are involved in addressing cervical cancer, that HIV-positive women are six times more likely to get cervical cancer. Um, and so that fact led us at the Bush Institute to partner with Merck and with PEPFAR and with UNAIDS and with Roche to address this issue, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. We now have 4.4 million women who've been screened through the program. And it is five partners working together that bring very different things to the table um, to be able to do that. So, Mamadi, I want to start with you. Let's talk a little bit about PEPFAR. Um, you've had a whole variety of roles in this program. Um, you served as the U.S.'s PEPFAR coordinator uh, in Malawi. Just talk a little bit about how the global response has transformed in 20 years of PEPFAR. Well, first of all, what an honor to be here. And those folks who know me know how much PEPFAR is a mission uh, for me. And what an honor it was to have the Minister of Health from Malawi here a moment ago. We were in country three weeks ago visiting um, some programs that had been established for supporting um, MSM and transgender uh, communities, uh, individuals in communities. And the, just the privilege of getting to see stuff we fought for in 2006, in 2007, now realized where the community was actually supporting these drop-in centers. People were able to come and get relief and feel dignified for a few moments of a day. That, to me, is the power of this program, that we have had the support for as long as we have had, and that we have the privilege to actually see it transform the lives of the individuals it was intended to serve. So I am thrilled that we are here 20 years later that our new ambassador, John Kengasong, is building on the shoulders of giants who have led this program. And that's the, pl the, the privilege for me, too. All of those are ambassadors I served. And to see us just keep going forward and building on what they had done um, is an incredible honor. So you mentioned the ambassador. He's, he's now had a little over 100 days on the job. 
Talk about his priorities, particularly as it relates to partnerships and transformational partnerships. Indeed, and uh, one of the things that uh, have, have, has been an uh, interesting approach to watch is that we have come this far because of some incredible partners that we have in the PEPFAR program who continue to be important. But he wants to elevate those partners who have not been in the room, who COVID has taught us, actually need to be part of the conversation. He talks about regional dialogues that we need to do more of, that we need to ask those who we're serving how we can better serve them. So I think that we are going to see a whole slew of um, new players in the space that I think will be part of what transforms us moving forward. So really excited to see that part of his agenda realized. Okay, and I wanna ask you one last question before turning to Carmen. Talk a little bit about your perspective on PEPFAR and the platform it's created to be able to address cervical cancer, how it's affected the treatment of COVID, mm -hmm. Uh, diseases like Ebola. What are we seeing from the from the systems that are being built? Well, one of the one of the clearest evidence are the places that haven't had PEPFAR's investment and what happened during the COVID experience. I think our governments, um, where PEPFAR programs and PEPFAR platforms were able to be leveraged got to also see what they could do because you know everybody had to come home when COVID happened and I'm curious what the minister is going to reflect on when it's her turn to talk about but that healthcare workforce those laboratories if they were not there people would have had to put them in place but instead they were available to be leveraged for COVID so it's so much more I mean we are we our purpose is to end AIDS and that remains our focus but we know, and many people have now experienced, that what PEPFAR offered, has offered goes so much further uh, than only the HIV uh, um, experience. And you, with regard to what you asked specifically about cervical cancer, that integrating services for the women that we serve is a key feature of our future. We've been trying to do it, but COVID has freed up, um, uh, 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 just permitted us to actually know that this is what the client wants, this is what the moment calls for, and we're ready to embrace it. Great. So Carmen, let's talk a little bit about Merck. Uh, you are one of our private sector partners in the Go Further partnership. Um, talk a little bit about what, and when we kicked it off, it was, it was the Bush Institute, it was PEPFAR, and it was UNAIDS. What sort of drew you to this? And talk a little bit about the, the expertise that you bring sure. to the table. Sure, and thanks for that, and thanks for having me here today. It's great to see all of you and to be with partners new and old uh, around the world. I think, you know, at Merck, we really have invested a lot in partnerships over time. Our company has been in existence for over 125 years. We are committed to things like ending river blindness and hopefully helping address maternal mortality worldwide. It's in the ethos of the DNA of who we are as a company. Vaccines have been innovations that the company has really promoted and been a part of for years. If you think about childhood vaccinations, you just heard from my colleague Drew. Um, we have either invented, have innovated, or helped manufacture the majority of childhood recommended vaccinations in, in the US. And I think that commitment, when we were invited by PEPFAR and the Bush Institute and the Go Further Partnership to help contribute to this growing problem that we were seeing, I mean, as more women were coming in, getting diagnosed and treated for HIV, this prevalence of HPV was going not unnoticed, but not really addressed. And so when we were invited in to be able to learn more about the interactions of those two diseases and how we could help through our innovations, we thought, well, why not? That information that we're learning through that partnership, we're able to share back with countries and women all over the world. And that knowledge empowers those women and girls to better attain the healthcare and the quality of healthcare that they deserve and they need. And so what are you seeing now? Where do we stand on the HPV vaccine now, particularly after several years of COVID? Yeah, unfortunately, I think 
HPV vaccine is not something that people regularly think about. You know, you have a newborn, you're in a well visit, you know what childhood immunizations should be for your child. When you think about getting them when they get a little bit older and they're 9, 10, 11, 12, you're not always thinking about that. And we haven't seen the, ba the bounce back for HPV vaccinations as much as we would like to see. And I think it's very important. I was just talking to a girlfriend last night at dinner who has two teenage daughters and really helping her understand the, important, the importance and the commitment we're making to women and girls all over the world. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, let's go to the minister. Let's talk about what you're seeing in East Watini and, and the progress you've made and, and what else needs to be done. So um, East Watini uh, was the first to reach the ambitious targets for HIV testing and treatment, the 95, 95, 95 targets. First of all, congratulations for doing that. Um, ahead of when so many other countries uh, are doing this and ahead of the goals, what Talk about your experience as the Minister of Health. What strategies and partnerships were crucial to meeting those goals? Thank you. First of all, let me say it is such a privilege to be here and sitting with this distinguished panel and talking about things that are, are so um, important in our lives and in the, in the way we're looking at HIV and AIDS. I think whatever I'm going to say here today might not truly reflect the importance of a collaboration and a partnership with PEPFAR, for instance, where you are seeing consistency, responsiveness, as um, we are dealing with a virus that has had, um, um, we've been dealing with it for the last three decades, and it's a very difficult one. But getting partners that are consistent are staying the, the, the journey with us. And PEFA particularly has been very good at ensuring that as we go into new innovative ways, PEFA stays with us in that journey. So uh, you're asking an important, it's a, such a big question. What has happened in the last 20 years? You know, we're talking, if I'm looking at uh, 2010 even, and looking at, we've actually halved the deaths um, by this time. If you're looking at the time we started, um, on the journey with PEFA, the government had already, uh, His Majesty declared HIV as an emergency in 1999. <coughs> government then committed to buying H A A ARVs at that point, meaning government was committing to moving a lot of health resources into making sure we can have a ARVs. But you know that is only a small part of the story that we needed to, to, to get where where we are today and ensuring that it is, uh, we can find people, we can um, uh, diagnose, we can treat, we can follow up, and it is that critical part of the journey that we've been working on with, with PEPFA. Over the time, uh, you, you I, I, like I said to you earlier, the question is so big that when I was preparing, I was making so many notes, but what is important here is what we have been doing together with PEPFA, together with many other partners, but def definitely uh, together with PEPFA, is looking at eliminating uh, pediatric uh, HIV and AIDS. <coughs> Excuse me, I need to cough and I'm trying not to. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and the structural interventions that have gone into making the program a success. Looking at social behavior change interventions mm -hmm. in the process, uh, doing biomedical interventions that um, expanded the use of condoms in, in the country, uh, looking at impact mitigation, and this is very, very important, uh, supporting and strengthening government at community level now, mm -hmm. and ensuring that those community um, uh, uh, services are actually working. Say a little bit more about that. How have you gone about doing that? Mm -hmm. We, uh, I'm sorry. Take, a, water. take a sip of water. Take a sip of water. <laughs> it, it really is a, a number of strategies at community level. We um, were looking at children and caregivers. We're looking at young people and young girls and working uh, with PEPFA, we're working on dreams and other uh, uh, 
uh, activities that are, are, are we're looking at protection we're looking um, those community um, services are still there and we're looking at um, linkages really between testing counseling and treatment and keeping those at community level and raising community workers who are themselves champions raising young people are champions raising people living with hiv and mothers uh, with, with hiv as champions in community and ensuring that we are getting the services there i think the advent of uh, COVID, for instance was really important for us because we started looking at other innovative ways of reaching people in the community of getting the treatment to the people in the community on demand um, I don't know if I'm answering yeah. question no, enough, right. but um, yeah. You Can know. you say a little bit more? I want to talk about cervical cancer in particular. You mentioned girls, yeah. adolescent girls and young women, um, reaching them on HIV AIDS and also reaching them on cervical cancer, on screening, on vaccination. Talk a little bit about where you are on that, the progress you've made and the gaps you still have and, and how you're going about this work. Um, it, the, you, you know, you, you mentioned the Go Further um, uh, initiative with, with PEPFA, with Merck, with uh, Roche, and uh, with UNAIDS. Mm -hmm. That has changed the way we are looking at things. It would look like it's really successful. But I just want to give you some of those numbers. Uh, we are looking at around, um, out of 318, uh, women that are, are, are diagnosed with uh, cervical cancer, 217 of them actually die. Mm -hmm. And what that has done is to change that so that we can intervene early. We're in the process now, we're developing uh, four centers across the country, four centers of excellence, where we're using the LEAP system. So we are ensuring that women can be treated on the spot as they come in. This is really important because we're dealing with a, um, a cancer that has twinned itself with HIV. So you said earlier that women with HIV are six times as much uh, as, as, as vulnerable as anybody else. So we're dealing with that. But on the other hand, you know, it's one of those that we know is preventable. Now we know it's preventable. So we need to try and put as much effort at ensuring that we can uh, uh, vaccinate our girls you, you're making a very important point about that. Mm -hmm. But we want to vaccinate them before they are 15. Mm -hmm. It's a little too late. We want to start at nine year old, but we want to vaccinate them before they are 15. It means that we need to be able to access those vaccines, access the appropriate ones. We have um, of the HPV um, varieties that we have, we have some really uh, dangerous ones, let me put it that way. What we found in the studies that we did together in the Go Further, we found that um, it's not just HPV, we're dealing with STIs, uh, we're dealing with a whole load of other vulnerabilities within women a a at the time, but we're dealing with um, uh, genotypes that make sure, you know, that eventually make women a lot more vulnerable to getting cancer. Yep. So, um, these interventions that we're doing now, uh, again, mm -hmm. I'm saying they look very successful. We're happy with where we are. We need to go a lot further mm -hmm. in, in ensuring that uh, <laughs> we can reach, <laughs> we can reach as many as, as, yes, uh, go a lot further in ensuring that we can reach um, uh, all the girls, the young girls in, in prevention, uh, but we can reach as many women because we are surprised that even though we've been doing this work since 2017 and we're continuing with it, we still get women that come to us a little late, mm -hmm. yes. come into this health services right. a little late. Right. So we are still losing women to cervical cancer and it should not happen. Well, so we really need to put more concerted effort into prevention. Yes, we yeah. do. And that's actually, you know, to the point of this discussion about partnerships, one of the thing we all know that we all have constant conversation about as part of this partnership is how do we both address the front end mm -hmm. and the back end of the treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to continue at it, right? It's part of our evolving partnership as yep. part of Go Further and, and the amazing platform that PEPFAR has created to allow us to do this work. Well, I know we could talk for a lot longer. Thank you all for being here today. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you to the Bush Institute.